Good afternoon. Today we're going to be tying the dark Cahill dry fly, and we're also going to learn a little bit about fishing that fly. As an introduction, I want to uh, give you some idea where the name came from. Well, if you hadn't read our newsletter, the Cahill um, dry fly was first designed by a uh, railroad worker named Daniel Cahill. And Daniel had tried to imitate some of the light mayflies that uh, hatch in the springtime. And so his first fly was uh, referred to as the light Cahill dry fly. But today we're gonna to be tying the dark Cahill dry fly. And I'm, I'm, I've chose that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it imitates some of the lighter colored, I mean, sorry, the darker colored mayflies that hatch in the early spring. So this fly will be useful uh, probably from March through May of this year. Um, the other reason that I chose this fly, the Dark Cahill, is because it's mon one of the easier dry fly patterns to tie, and it uses very much the same uh, materials that would be used in other types of dry flies, and it is somewhat easier to tie. But before we proceed, I'd like to talk a little bit about what is a dry fly. Well, basically a dry fly is imitating the mature form of any aquatic insect, whether it be a caddis fly, a mayfly, or stonefly, or even other types of aquatic uh, insects. It's called a dry fly because basically it is the form of a fly as it hatches when it floats on the surface of the water. And so we commonly refer to those as being dry flies, regardless of what type it is. So I'm going to first describe a little bit about the basic materials of a Cahill dry fly. First of all, we're going to be using a standard 1x long, long dry, uh, long dry fly hook. And I've chosen the size 10 uh, today because it's going to be a little bit easier to demonstrate the tying methods using uh, a larger fly. But uh, you could try this, uh, you could tie this dry fly in, in uh, various sizes from 10 down to maybe even a 16. The next thing I'm going to be um, telling you is we're going to be using a brown uh, size 6 aught thread. The dubbing for the dry fly is going to be muskrat dubbing, which is also referred to as just uh, gray uh, dry fly dubbing. This particular uh, pack from Orvis um, is also referred to as Adam's Gray. So the term Adam's Gray, muskrat, dark gray, those are all synonymous for this fly and all other types of mayflies. We're going to be using wood duck feathers for the wing of this fly. And wood duck feathers uh, are a little bit more expensive because wood ducks are not as uh, plentiful as mallards, but as you might be able to see when I hold up this pack, um, they're virtually the same in terms of color. Um, often they will take what's referred to as lemon wood, uh, lemon mallard, and they will dye it a little bit, and then it's referred to as wood duck. But I'm going to be using wood duck feathers today, and um, this will be used for the wing of the fly. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out is that we're going to be using neck hackle. Uh, and when I'm talking about neck hackle, think of it in terms of the neck of the bird, whether it be a, um, a rooster, or whether it be any other type of, uh, of fowl. Yeah, the feathers that are on the neck are generally referred to as the neck hackle as compared with saddle hackle, which tends to be the feathers further back on, on the back of a chicken or whatever. Uh, in particular, we use the neck hackle uh, from a rooster because it's somewhat stiffer 
and uh, the fibers tend to be somewhat longer, uh, the feather fibers. And so I'm, I'd like to point out um, something to you before we go much further. And I'm basically going to be comparing uh, two different hackle necks um, so that you, when the time comes that you may want to buy a neck hackle, you'll know what you're looking for. Now, this particular neck hackle has all of the small attributes, the small fibers that come in various sizes as we proceed up the neck to the point where we get to the rather large hackle which uh, can be used for putting on the tail on a fly, but most likely the hackle that's going around the neck of the fly is going to be some of this finer, stiffer material. I'd like you to compare this with this, which is much fuller. This is a more expensive neck hackle. It's basically the same thing, but it is uh, more uniform. There's feathers available on both sides of this neck um, and some of them get very small down to the bottom so you could tie a flies as small as a size 20, a 22, maybe even a 24. Uh, so if you're investing in uh, neck hackle, you probably want to try to match up your flying persuasions uh, with your pocketbook. So uh, today I, I thought I would mention those those features as we get into it so that you really know what we're talking about. Okay, so now that we've covered some of the materials, um, I want to mention the things that we're going to be learning today because remember this is part of our series which we've been referring to for over a year as our beginner series. So I'm trying to, in each case to mention what we're, uh, or talk a little bit about what we're learning with each session as we go through this series of, of learning to tie some of the basic flies. So we're going to be learning how to prep or prepare the feather wing and then how to tie it in. And that's one of the first things that I'm going to demonstrate when we get into the tying. I'm going to be also showing you how to tie in a nice stiff tail on the fly so that basically it helps with buoyancy to keep that fly up off the water. Um, I will, we will again address how to dub the abdomen of the fly, particularly um, this type of dubbing that we're going to use today, which is much finer than what we've used before when we were tying a soft hackle or a nymph, something like that. And I'm going to be talking also about how to prepare the neck hackle for the hackle collar that goes around the fly because there's a basic technique that I use and it's pretty consistent across um, most what, what most fly tires do. But um, I'm going to cover that, which will help you um, as you proceed in tying dry flies. And it, these techniques are applicable no matter what, what type of a dry fly you're, you're going to tie. So let's begin to tie. The first thing I want to point out is that, and by the way, I'm using brown thread um, in order to match the color of the fly. You could tie this with black, um, but it's always a good idea to choose a color of thread that's going to either be camouflaged by the rest of the material or blend in with, with the rest of the material. Now, the first thing I'm going to be doing is, is starting my thread, and we're not going to be starting the thread in, in quite the same way that we do on some of the other flies like streamers and wet flies and, and things like that. But I'm going to start about one third of the distance back from the eye of the hook. And so I'm gonna make a few wraps right there and then I'm going to wrap back towards the rear of the fly, but not go too far. I'm going to stop just about mid shank. And I'm going to then clip off this extra and wrap my thread back to the starting point. Now, you may ask why is it important to start this thread at this particular point? And it's because it's at that point, about one third of the distance back on the shank, uh, 
is where the wing of this fly is going to sit. And so now that we have the thread in place, the next thing I'm going to do is I have chosen one of the flank feathers of, of the wood duck feather from the flank, meaning the side of, of the, uh, the body of the, of the, uh, the bird. And so um, if you notice the filaments or individual fibers of this feather are relatively equal, but they create sort of a round appearance. If the, f if the fibers are too much on one side and not as, not as long and sufficient on the other side, that's probably not the best feather to use. So I have chosen this one, and as I, I hope you can see, it's relatively uniform across. The next thing I'm going to do is clip off the bottom portion of this feather because we don't need that. And then while holding the feather in my left hand, I'm going to stroke down the feather fibers with my right hand and measure the length of these fibers to be very consistent with the length of the shank of the hook. And now that I've done that, I'm moving my left hand forward, right to the point where the thread is hanging, which is again is about one third of the way back. And using pinch wraps, pinch referring to putting the thread between your finger and your thumb, and then pulling straight down, bring it around and doing the same thing another time. Now I have secured that bundle right at that location. I'm, I continue to hold my fingers around the butt end of this feather, and I'm wrapping back over that butt, almost to the point where I had originally made my thread wrap. I stop at that point. I lift up the feather at about a 45 degree angle, holding my scissors parallel with the shank of the hook. I clip that off. That's going to create a nice uniform taper back here and not create a bump in the, in the abdomen of the fly. Now, the next thing we want to do is be able to stand these fibers up. And in contrast to tying a wet fly where you tie in the feather so that the fibers are pointed back, in a dry fly, you tie it the opposite direction and you tie that wing in first so that that wing is in place and it's firmly seated. The next thing I will be doing is bringing my thread forward to where I started to secure that feather. And then I'm going to hold this up and hold it back and make several wraps right in front, almost creating sort of a triangular shaped uh, bed of, of thread. Some people refer to this as sort of a dam. And as you see, when I let go, <clears throat> Of the feather, it will be standing up. Now, not perfectly standing straight up, but that's that's not bad, okay? If it's leaning a little bit forward, we can correct that later on. Now that I have the wing in place, I'm going to wrap back over the abdomen all the way to the bend of the hook, stopping just about directly above the barb. So we're at the point where the thread is now hanging and I've picked up this uh, one section, one feather of the, the, uh, the neck of the, uh, the bird. And I'm going to flare this uh, just to see where the stiff hackles are that I want to use. And notice that at this end, um, this is very soft and it's not going to be usable. So we can clip that off and, and discard it. Now we're down at that point where the, where the fibers are relatively stiff and they're sticking out. Um, so what I generally do, I could cut these off with my scissors and try to stack them in some manner, but the simplest way to do this is to just grasp a number of these fibers with your, my left hand, and then as I'm holding on to the stem, I basically just tear them off like that and I have a nice bundle of 
fibers that are all the same length because I had bent them and, and uh, spread them out away from the shank. Uh, it takes a couple times to do that, but once you learn that technique, believe me, you will always use it. Now, the next thing I want to do is measure these fibers so that they are about the length of the hook, of the shank of the hook. And that's about right, right there. So I'm going to transfer them to my left hand, just clip this off slightly, and place this right on top of the shank of the hook. Make several pinch wraps with my thread, and then take a look at how this is, and I'm satisfied with that. I continue to hold this with my left hand, make a few more wraps, just to tie that bundle down, and then wrap it forward. And if you'll notice, the junction of where I clipped off the these the feather butts comes right up next to the butt end of the uh, wing. And so now I have a relatively smooth transition between the rear of the fly and the front of the fly. Okay, so notice where I've stopped my thread. It's about one third of the way forward. And the reason I did that rather than going all the way back to the end of the hook is that I'm gonna be, be applying my dubbing next to the thread and starting the dubbing in such a manner. Now, I've chosen a clump of that, um, would we, we would refer to it as either muscat gray or Adams gray dubbing. And dry fly dubbing is, tends to be much softer. It has fewer fibers in it than you would find if you were dubbing a nymph or a wet fly because the body of this mature fly, this dry fly, has to be relatively smooth. It can't be too spiky, otherwise it's not gonna float on the surface. Now, one other thing that I meant, would mention to you is that beavers, because they're you know, water mammals, the fur from a beaver is much more buoyant on a dry fly than is that of, from, a, let's say, a rabbit or a possum or something like that. Nonetheless, you can use either one. But uh, if you have the opportunity to buy um, beaver dubbing in whatever color you want, such as in what we refer to as muskrat gray or, or, or Adam's gray, um, you could do that. So I'm going to take, I always wet my finger just a slight bit so I can hold the dubbing. I'm pulling it off in very small uh, units and I wrap it on counterclockwise. Then I can slide this right up next to the fly, but not quite all the way to touch that. Remember I said that I was starting this dubbing portion of the thread just slightly in front of the tail. And the reason for that is now, as I make my first couple wraps, I'm able to place the thinnest part of my dubbing noodle, so to speak, right at the rear of the fly. And then I can begin to come forward, building up the abdomen in such a manner. Now, you say, well, I've only gone part way forward, so I'm going to add some more dubbing to the fly, uh, to the thread, and dub the rest of the abdomen. I will stop that just right behind the wing, leaving a little space there to tie in my hackle, hackle collar. Okay, so now I have the um, abdomen dubbed and I'll just clip off a few little fibers there that I'm not happy about. The next thing I'm going to do is um, choose, and I have already chosen, a neck hackle that is the right size for this. This is a size 10 hook. Um, I have tied a little bit earlier um, a size 
a 10 and a 12, you can see that this one is slightly smaller than this one. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, this fly can be tied from size 10 to much smaller, even up as far as the 16. But for the beginner's class, I, I like to, to um, start with the largest hook that I can. And that's also a suggestion that I, I like to make to beginner tires or just tires in general. When you're learning a new pattern, don't be afraid to start with a, a much larger hook than you intend to fish with. You'll get your symmetry down, you get your proportions down, and once you get your finesse on that particular size, then move to the next size. You know, go from a, a 10 to a 12, a 14, a 16, until you end up with a, a sort of a broad variety of sizes. Um, and that's good because you never know what size the fish might be taking. Okay, so I've now chosen this hackle, and notice that it is relatively stiff. It's not like soft hackle um, that we would be using on a nymph. All right, so I don't need the, the entire um, hackle in order to make wraps around it. So I'm basically going to clip off about maybe a quarter of it, and I can begin to flare this just much the same way that I flared the... Uh, um, material for the tail and at the very end right at the what I refer to as the butt end I'm going to clip off some of the fibers it's only about maybe an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch but that creates a microscopic comb so to speak that allows the, th the thread to attach more firmly than if it were a bare shank now I'm holding this feather that I've prepared in such a manner that the convex side is uh, towards me and the concave side is towards the camera. I'm going to lay this feather then on my side of the fly so that this small comb is right where my thread is hanging and it protrudes forward um, onto the, the shank of the hook. And I make one or two wraps of thread right there, I'm sort of holding it at a, like a 45 degree angle or 30 degree angle, one or two wraps there, and then pull my wing out of the way and wrap it forward over the shank portion of the uh, uh, feather fiber or feather. All right, now just for the sake of sort of securing everything in place, I'm going to make one thread wrap to anchor my thread there. And then I can basically pull my thread out of the way. Notice the next thing that I do, because at this point, the feather is lying parallel with the hook to the rear of the hook. I'm basically going to what I refer to as break the back of the feather. I'm going to pick it up, pull it towards me, and break it so that now it's not only standing up, but it's facing me. It's not facing the back. So that basically takes the stiffness out of the hackle and it's going to allow it to stand up. So now that I have that in place, I'm going to put my hackle pliers onto the feather and begin to make my wraps. Now, the reason why it was important to lay the feather concave towards the camera side is such that when I'm wrapping, now the fibers are going to stand up, but they're also going to be shaped back towards the back of the hook. So I begin to make a wrap. The first wrap is going to be the furthest from the wing. And then each successive wrap is going to be closer to the wing. Count your wraps because you want to have one more wrap behind the feather wing than in front. So if you're doing three here, do two in front. If you're doing four here, do three in front. Do not put more than more in front than behind because then the fly is going to be a little bit top heavy and it's going to dip towards, um, towards the eye of the hook. So it looks like I'm going to be able to make at least three wraps back here. And then I hold the wing back and I begin to make two to three wraps in front. 
That first wrap was right next to the wing. The next one is a little bit further forward. And the last one that I'm going to do is right about there. Okay. Now that gives us plenty of room to tie off the head of the fly. And in fact, I'm just going to take advantage of that by making one more wrap there. I th if anything, I have the same number in front as behind. I cross the thread across the <clears throat> part of the feather that's still dangling or still attached to my um, hackle pliers. I make two wraps behind. I hold the, the fibers back and make a couple wraps in front. Now I can clip off that hackle and then make sure that I've got everything the way I want it this up and finish off the head of the fly. Now you might find it easier to do this to finish off the head of this fly um, with just the uh, a whip finisher or with a regular um, head tool. And then I clip this off, and we have a finished fly. Well, now that we have tied this Cahill dry fly, let's talk for a short bit about how to fish it or any other type of dry fly. Um, in my mind, there's basically two ways that I commonly fish a dry fly. One is either fishing it alone as a single fly or fishing it with what we refer to as a dropper. In other words, you'd have a nymph or a wet fly um, about maybe six inches to 18 inches, maybe even further behind the dry fly, depending upon the depth of the water. And of course you would fish it with weight forward floating line because the, it is a dry fly, it needs to float on the surface, so your line needs to be floating on the surface. Now, another thing to remember, however, is the length of the leader because you don't want this, this dry fly, which the fish are going to be looking up to, in order to suck it in, to take it, to, to, to you know, bite this on this fly. Um, it needs to be at a relatively far distance from the end of your line. So I always use at least a nine and maybe even a 10 and a half foot uh, leader, tapered leader uh, at the end of my weight forward floating line. And then you might ask about, well, what size tippet do you use? And of course the tippet is the, re referring to the ultimate end of the leader. And so we try to match the tippet to the size of the dry fly. And there is commonly re referred to as the rule of three, which means if you can divide your hook size by the number three, that should be your tippet size, or that should be the approximate uh, size in terms of the diameter of the tippet that you're going to use. And I'll give you two examples. If I'm fishing with a size 12 fly, I divide that 12 by 3, and I know that uh, my line and my rig will, will that's set up will be about a 4x tippet. However, if I proceed to be using maybe a size 18 dry fly, divide that by 3, and you get six. And so the tippet at the very end that you're going to tie the fly on could be as, as, as uh, small as a 6x. So just can't kind of keep that rule of, of three in mind and it's going to help you decide, well, what size tippet should I be using with this fly? We'll base it on the size of the hook. Now you can go one hook size either way and not have to worry about your tippet size but you don't want to be trying to, to cast a, uh, a large fly with a very fine tippet, nor just the opposite. You don't want to be, be trying to cast a very small fly with a tippet that's going to be basically slapping down on the water. So, um, 
Okay, so next, my next thing that I'd like to address is when to fish a dry fly. Well, you know, typically you fish a dry fly when you see fish rising to the surface because they are obviously taking something off the surface and so your presentation should be on the surface. The other time that you might choose a dry fly is to target a specific fish. In other words, let's say you're on the stream and you can see that fish and it doesn't seem to be coming up to the surface. And you say, well, then why in the world would I want to shoot to uh, use a dry fly? Well, if you present the, the right food form to a fish that's uh, not rising, it may come up. It may not be rising at everything that floats by, but your presentation might induce that fish to come up and take the fly. So in that case, try to match the dry fly that you're using. If you're going to be fishing, targeting a specific fly, a specific fish, try to use a, a fly that you know is being is hatching in a particular area. If it's a caddis, don't offer it a stone fly. If it's a mayfly, choose a mayfly pattern. Okay. The other time that you might be using a dry fly is when you're doing what we call searching. In that case, use a non-specific dry fly. Many of us like to use an Adams because an Adams is sort of like, you know, the all around cereal in a, you know, on the grocery shelf. It's everybody wants to buy Wheaties, whatever. Not so many people want to buy, you know, some sort of a chocolate flavored uh, type of. And the same thing that, that goes with choosing a fly because the Adams is one of the basic flies, particularly a, a, an Adams dry fly, um, use that as your searching pattern. Okay, so we talked a little bit about those, those features. So what, what do you want to avoid when you're fishing with a dry fly? And I'm gonna repeat this in order for you to really get the, the importance of this. Drag, drag, drag. You want to avoid dragging that fly. And that fly, the dragging of that fly is created by the dragging of the current on your line. And so if your line is too far downstream from your dry fly, it's going to drag the fly and the fish can detect that. The best thing that you can do when you're fishing a dry fly is to have your line moving basically at the same rate as the fly so that there's no drag either upstream or downstream from that fly. So, and the other thing that you want to avoid is avoid casting across multiple currents. Let's say you're standing along the side of the stream and you, you see a fish or you want to fish an area and maybe that is 20 feet from you. But in between you and that really good looking water, there's several different currents. If you try to cast a dry fly across multiple currents, your fly is probably only going to be presenting itself for a few seconds before one of those opposing currents is starting your fly to drag. In that case, pick the water closest to you, fish it first, move out a little bit further, fish that section, and then finally you may get to the, that area that really what you think is prime at least you're not going to be fishing across uh, different currents. One other thing I want to point out is when you're fishing a dry fly in particular, don't fish with the sun at your back because it's going to be casting a shadow onto the water and the, the fish is, is going to see that. So you should be basically looking at the sun so that um, there's no shadow of yours that, that's being cast on the water. No sooner will your shadow um, come across that fish and that fish is going to get spooked. So lastly, um, what do we want to do if the, if the dry fly that you're using doesn't get a strike and the fish still continues to rise? So you know that that fish is feeding, but for some reason your offering is not what that fish wants to eat. The first thing that it's generally recommended to do is stick with the same fly, but go to the next smaller size of fly that you're using. So if you started off, let's say with an Adams and it's a size 14, 
and the fish are ignoring it, before you give up on that atoms, try a size 16 or try something similar to the atoms in a size 16 and always use that as your rule of thumb. Generally, there's three things that, that uh, will cause a fish not to take a dry fly. And the first is the uh, size. And the second is the behavior, and I already talked about that. And only lastly, has, does it have anything to do with the color of the fly? So keep those things in mind. You might also think about changing your presentation to the fly. In other words, if the fish is ignoring you, move slightly so that you're getting a slightly different position as you're casting to that fly. So in conclusion, dry fly fishing is perhaps the most exciting type of fishing. It always has been for me. And when the fish are feeding on the surface, that's the most rewarding time because there's nothing like watching that fish come up, take your fly, and then you set the hook and land it. And that is utopia. So I hope that you learned something today about dry flies, uh, tying dry flies and dry fly fishing. And I wish you the best as you go out on the stream. Have a good day.